A somber ceremony in Kyiv to mark the first anniversary of Russian assault on Ukraine. One year of staggering losses, destruction and displacement. China unveils a 12-point path to peace. We have details and analysis. Badly needed new infrastructure for El Salvador, part of major projects across Latin America led by China under the Belt and Road Initiative. And celebrating China's manned space program, three decades of operations and achievements. Live from Washington, this is The World Today. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Asiye Namdar in Washington. It's been one year since Russian forces crossed into Ukraine, opening up a devastating and destructive conflict that at this point shows no end in sight. Commemorations across Ukraine and the EU for the thousands of lives lost on both sides. President Volodymyr Zelensky says the only way to end the fighting was for Russia to get out of its territory. CGTN's Will Denslow joins us live from Kyiv, and Kyiv a solemn day indeed across uh, Ukraine. Azie, yeah, that's absolutely right. And that poignancy was not lost on Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky. At the start uh, of the day, he honored those that have lost, that have died over the past year. He also thanked the nation's soldiers. He said that there simply wouldn't be a Ukraine if it wasn't for those uh, fighting every single day for the nation. He said that a year ago, Ukraine had a choice. He said that they could either wave uh, the white flag of surrender or they instead chose the second option, to wave uh, the blue and yellow colours of Ukraine and continue to fight uh, for the nation. He said it's been a year where we've seen pain, sorrow, unity as well as faith. This comes as, of course, President Zelensky also had a strong message to, you, to Russia's President Vladimir Putin. He said he will not sit down to negotiate with him. And he told a group of journalists at a press conference that Ukraine's victory this year would be inevitable. As here. And, Will, as this war enters a second year, what exactly um, are Ukraine's ties with NATO? It seems stronger than ever. Yeah, that's right. Vladimir Zelensky said that this, uh, the war the past year has uh, helped NATO hit the reset button. We also know that there's been progress and a phone call with President Zelensky and the G7 in a readout from that group of nations. We know that they have agreed to increase their support militarily, uh, financially and diplomatically uh, for Ukraine. Now, interestingly, the G7 also saying that they will do more to target what they describe as third country actors who help support uh, Russia's um, war in Ukraine. Now, we've also heard from Vladimir Zelensky on the topic of the G7 meeting. He publicly thanked them uh, for their continued cooperation. He also said that he gave them a list of priorities. He said they were more weapons, sanctions, finances, justice and unity. Vladimir Zelensky said he was confident that progress could be made on all of those topics. Azie? Well, Denzlo, live for us in Kyiv. Russia will not capitulate. That reaction from Moscow after a UN resolution calling on the country to withdraw its forces from Ukraine. Some are calling the non-binding vote anti-Russian. Stuart Smith is in Moscow with more. Russia had dismissed the usefulness of the resolution even before the vote took place, saying it offered nothing substantive towards meaningful resolution. But it's being treated as a win by the proponents of the vote, who say it shows Russia's actions are overwhelmingly interpreted as illegitimate by the global community, Russian forces should leave Ukraine immediately, and that Ukrainian sovereignty should be protected. Meanwhile, from Moscow, the defense ministry issued a warning to Kiev not to invade a separatist region of Moldova that borders Ukraine called Transnistria. 
Moscow says it's seen a significant accumulation of Ukrainian personnel and military equipment near the border with the self-declared republic, as well as an unprecedented number of flyovers by unmanned aircraft. The region contains a massive weapons cache believed to be the largest in Eastern Europe. Although no country, including Russia, recognizes the region as independent, Moscow has close bilateral ties with its rebel leaders and without Moldova's permission has around 1,500 troops there. That led the Council of Europe last year to call it Russian-occupied territory. Moscow says if Ukraine attacks, it will be considered an attack on Russia. But Moldova has dismissed Russia's claim of an impending provocation and has called for calm. Stuart Smith, CGTN, Moscow. G7 leaders mark the anniversary by holding a virtual meeting. Talks taking place as U.S. announced yet another new round of sweeping sanctions targeting Russia. CGTN's Nathan King joins us live from the White House. Nathan, what can you tell us? Well, yeah, virtual meeting, but obviously symbolic uh, because of this anniversary. G7 leaders uh, expressing uh, largely unwavering support for Kiev. In fact, Vladimir Zelensky himself addressed uh, the uh, uh, meeting, even though, of course, he's not uh, part of the G7. And there's a whole raft of measures being announced by G7 countries uh, independently, but also moves towards coordination. Uh, the U.S. announcing uh, sanctions on over 200 entities and individuals, including uh, from Russia, but also other nations that they think uh, are somehow skirting uh, sanctions or backfilling, as they call it, uh, uh, Russian uh, uh, military capabilities without giving direct military supplies. And that includes some Chinese entities as well. Also, the G7 uh, announcing what they are calling an enforcement coordination mechanism when it comes to uh, implementing sanctions. Now, remember, these are not United Nations sanctions. These are U.S. EU and other sanctions, so they don't carry the full weight of international law. But what has frustrated the G7 nations and the White House here is that, you know, all these predictions of Russian economic collapse have not happened, and essentially uh, Russia has uh, uh, defended its economy against sanctions uh, extremely well. So they're trying to work out ways of uh, more effectively implementing them. Uh, but of course, you know, Russia still uh, exports legally uh, about a billion dollars worth of energy a day in terms of its national receipts. So uh, we'll wait and see. But what I think the real message here is, is that on this year anniversary of this conflict, is the G7 is doubling down on its support for Kyiv whether it's financial, there's more money coming for the uh, 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 Kiev's budget from the U.S. today, uh, whether it's, uh, of course, military aid uh, and rhetorical support. Uh, they, after one year, are doubling down. Uh, Nathan, China and a number of other countries um, are pushing for peace talks, some kind of settlement and this right. nightmare. What's the reaction among, uh, you know, uh, Western leaders? Yeah, I mean, you know, we've had uh, bubblings from Brasilia to Beijing in terms of setting out roadmaps for a, a possible peace. You know, after a year of fighting and hundreds of thousands of casualties, uh, you know, this is important. And also, let's face it, the economic cost for the rest of the world for this war in Europe. So it's not surprising that we're seeing peace initiatives from the developing world, considering the West has sort of uh, taken its stance. But I can tell you, uh, there has been a rapid reaction from the White House dismissing almost uh, instantly uh, Beijing's position paper about uh, a, a need for a ceasefire and negotiations. Uh, Lula uh, da Silva, as you know, uh, uh, the uh, Brazilian president was here just a couple of weeks ago, and I can tell you there was no comments whatsoever about him pushing for peace uh, while uh, this war was going on. So essentially, cold water would be an understatement uh, what, that Washington is doing, but uh, they are essentially saying that if there wants to be peace, Vladimir, Vladimir Putin can pull his troops out of Ukraine tomorrow. Nathan King, live for us at the White House. More now on China's plan. It's really a 12-point plan for a political settlement, as we were talking to Nathan about. First off, it calls for respecting the sovereignty of all countries and that all parties should abandon Cold War mentality. It also calls for an end to hostilities, also resolving the humanitarian crisis, civilians and prisoners of war, must be protected and nuclear plants must be kept safe. It also says nuclear weapons must not be used or even threatened. 
Grain exports must be facilitated. Unilateral sanctions should be stopped. And all parties should keep the conflict from disrupting global industries and supply chains. Lastly, it calls on the international community to support reconstruction. Once the crisis is over, the plan is based on a blueprint President Xi Jinping formulated uh, calls the, uh, called the four musts. CGTN sends you on. Explains. So Jianhua, the uh, foreign ministry spokesperson Wang Wenbin said this afternoon that China has been playing a constructive role in resolving the crisis. What he means here is especially it's included in the 12 points uh, paper that um, both sides should respect sovereignty and territory integrity as well as abandon the Cold War mentality as well as a promotion of ceasefire and also promotion of peace talk and also um, call on assist on humanitarian crisis relief effort. I think it's important to understand the backdrop and also the context of such paper, um, Chinese President Xi Jinping has said four months to give China's position on this. He has also repeatedly mentioned during major international um, conversation, including the bilateral meeting with uh, Joe Biden at G20. So this has been what's supporting China's position on such issue. The four must including uh, respect the sovereignty and territorial integrity, as well as um, understand and observe the purpose and principles of UN Charter as well as um, understand uh, the legitimate security concern as well as uh, peaceful settlement of such crisis. So these are the four must that pretty much support what the 12 points are coming out of. Meanwhile, it's also important to understand China's position in terms of joint efforts in four areas. That includes peaceful resolve the crisis against use or potential use threat of nuclear weapons as well as uh, stability of global supply chain as well as um, resolve the humanitarian crisis. I think it's important that experts say the four must pretty much outline the position that China is holding, uh, suggested by President Xi. But the four joint, uh, the joint effort in four areas pretty much is what China has called on the international community to work together to resolve such crisis. Well, from analysis, let me turn to Yuval Weber. He's a research assistant professor at Texas A&M's Bush School of Government and Public Service here in Washington. Yuval, you and I have talked about this crisis from literally uh, weeks after it started. Um, mm. China's peace plan, let me begin with that. Zelensky of Ukraine, President Zelensky, called it a declaration. And from what our reporter Nathan King said to us from the White House a short time ago, the White House is not really taking this any seriously. Talk about this uh, peace proposal, if you will, and if China could actually play a constructive uh, role in this. So sure. So uh, obviously the White House has one position and uh, Zelensky of Ukraine uh, didn't reject it out of hand, I think, in deference to the role that China may be able to play. But ultimately, if the the context and the content of the peace declaration or sort of like the peace plan is for Ukraine to accept uh, giving up its territories. Um, no matter how polite Zelensky is going to be in saying no, he's not going to accept that uh, for several reasons. One, he'd be out of office probably later that afternoon. Uh, and to, because of what the Ukrainian people have clearly indicated is that any amount of their territory that is under Russian control basically results in like, the human rights atrocities uh, seen in Bucha and things of that nature. So fundamentally, Ukraine is seeking to retake its territory. And the resolution of this conflict will be at what point they're no longer able to credibly retake territory, um, and at what point Russia um, effectively collapses and is no longer able to uh, sustain its presence on Ukrainian territory. You know, uh, whatever China is going to do has to basically respond to those realities of the two combatants. I thought it was interesting that the first thing this 12-point plan actually mentions is it calls for respecting the sovereignty of all countries. But, okay, moving on from this, why is it that only a handful of countries, Yuval, are actually talking about some kind of peace settlement? Uh, Turkey's Erdogan has brought it up. Uh, Brazil's uh, Lula Silva has talked about it. Now China is talking about it. Why aren't more countries in the Western developing world talking about some kind of solution here? So sure, again, so peace sounds great, sovereignty sounds great, but what it comes down to in the reality here is, uh, for example, Russia has annexed uh, territories of Ukraine that it doesn't militarily control. So what's more important? Russia's um, 
basically paper sovereignty for, for the territory that Ukraine has that was its own before this conflict. So any of those peace plans that don't recognize Ukraine wants its territory back and Russia's trying to create a new norm where one big country invades another and then uses the threat of nuclear warfare in order to hold on to that territory. If that's essentially the new norm and the new definition of sovereignty, you can then see that there's going to be very little buy-in from much of the world onto um, going away from the traditional notions of territoriality, autonomy, and sovereignty being you get to control your, your own territory, your own borders, uh, no matter what the, let's say, inquisitive neighbors would like. I'm going to ask you a, a same question I asked you when this first started. Uh, what is Vladimir Putin's end game at this point? And have Western sanctions on Russia really moved the needle in any way to change anything? So sure. So roughly a year ago, when, when you posed that question, I, I think I answered something in effect of he doesn't want you know to govern all of Ukraine in terms of paying for it, but he wants a relationship with Ukraine that. You know, Russia had for a great number of decades, if not centuries, but basically what Russia has with Belarus right now. Belarus governs itself, but all of its major foreign security decisions, foreign economic policy decisions, those are basically either made in Moscow or approved in Moscow. Mm -hmm. That's what Putin wanted out of Ukraine, out of Kyiv, and that's what he still wants. In terms of whether he's able to do that, this is basically, you know, the, the prediction that I'll make for, you know, this year and the next is that effectively Putin is mortgaging Russia's future, it's, its economic ability to continue as a modern economy, as a modern nation. All of Russia's money is going to be using basically what we see out of the military budget now, what we see out of you know their domestic spending and so forth. Russia is going to have one, two, perhaps three years at most of continuing the status quo. And when that's done, Russia will be bankrupt to the extent that what we saw in 1998 or maybe 1993 before, they'll simply run out of money and they'll have an international crisis that resembles those experiences from the 1990s or perhaps, you know, in more recent memory, what we've seen in places like Argentina or Greece in, in recent years. And that's essentially what Putin is, uh, what he's basically threatening. He's basically willing to wager Russia's entire future to win this war in the short to medium term. And that's effectively what uh, what he's got on offer versus the Ukrainians. Yeah, and so many innocent people are paying the price. Yuval Weber, thank you. Coming up, a sneak peek of what could become one of Central America's most striking buildings, El Salvador's National Library. Construction already underway. Find out who's funding this massive project. focus was on friendship during a royal visit to Beijing. President Xi Jinping and his wife Pang Liwan hosted Cambodia's king Norodom Sihamoni and Cambodia's queen mother. She says China's ties with Cambodia are a model for international relations. The king says the 65th anniversary of diplomatic ties is an opportunity to deepen cooperation. China awarded the queen mother its friendship medal back in 2020. To China's Inner Mongolia region now, where rescue crews are racing against time to find survivors of a coal mine collapse. A huge chunk of hillside came crashing down and buried more than 50 miners on Wednesday. 47 are still missing. At least five were found dead. More than 1,000 people are now involved in the rescue. But now there's a new worry. Crews have to work carefully or risk a new collapse. China's Belt and Road Initiative is playing a critical role in developing infrastructure across Central and Latin America. CGTN's Alistair Barberstock takes a look at how that's changing the landscape in El Salvador. 
The central square of San Salvador, where construction is underway on what will soon be one of Central America's most striking buildings. Upon completion in November 2023, this will be El Salvador's National Library, a piece of infrastructure built and funded by China. For residents of the capital, it's an exciting prospect. This is a development for our youth, which will help our country. We should seek more investment and more ties with other nations because we can see the results right here in front of us. For El Salvador's Vice Minister for Culture, the library will add to the country's cultural fabric. For our country, this building will be the cornerstone of our promotion of literacy, a space for cultural events and the headquarters of our national library system. But China's construction work in El Salvador isn't limited to the center of the capital. China is leading construction on several major infrastructure projects here in El Salvador, including a new national stadium, two water treatment facilities, a pier on the coast, and this new national library here in the center of the capital, which is nearing completion. China's investment in Salvadoran infrastructure is part of China's global Belt and Road Initiative and got underway following the establishment of formal diplomatic relations between Beijing and San Salvador in 2018. And while the stadium and water treatment plants are still in the planning stages, the tourist pier on the coast is also close to completion. Development organizations in El Salvador say these projects bring big benefits to the country. We need to strengthen our commercial and financial ties with China. El Salvador has a lot to learn from China when it comes to poverty reduction, and our joining the Belt and Road Initiative will strengthen our infrastructure, education and regional development. Salvadoran President Nayib Bukele has already set out plans to visit China for a second time this spring, aiming to bring further development back with him from Beijing. Alastair Bavastok, CGTN, San Salvador. Now to Brazil, where at least 54 people have now died after devastating floods and mudslides. Hardest hit area, Sao Paulo State, where a number of communities have been completely cut off by damaged roads. Search and rescue teams are scrambling to find dozens still missing. More than 4,000 people were forced from their homes. Many are being sheltered in schools, churches, and more rainfall is expected in the coming days. Two Pakistani brothers are home after being freed from the U.S. military prison at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. The two men, Abdul and Mohammad Rabani, were arrested in 2002, accused of working for al-Qaeda. They were held for 20 years without ever formally being charged. The U.S. military prison was established to hold suspected extremists after the September 11 terror attacks in the U.S. And despite calls to shut it down, it is still open. 32 detainees remain behind bars at Gitmo. Still ahead, from humble beginnings to a palace in the heavens, we look at the development of China's space program, culminating with the Tiangong Space Station. Making sense of the overwhelming wave of information means cutting through the noise to shine a light on the heart of the story and making room for new perspectives. True understanding means the ability to see events from more than one side. I'm Liu Xin, and this is The Point.
Ariana's manned space program is celebrating 30 years of operations. CGTN Sun Ye speaks to an aerospace engineer who gives us some insight into the space development industry. In this thundering workshop, Liu Zheng has experienced firsthand how fast China's space development has slipped since he joined in 2005. He works on making rocket components by way of computer numerical control. So the goal has always been making the production process as smart, as precise, as efficient as possible. Those components are part of China's famous long march carrier rockets, from the ones that lift Taikonauts to space to the ones that carry compartments of Tiangong, China's newly, fully completed space station. And that rocket speed is felt on the ground in the workshop. When I first joined here in 2005, we launched one rocket every 10 years or so, and then is a dozen launches every year. Now is over 60 launches a year. And if you look at one trestle component for rockets, for example, in 2005, we made it with regular machine tools manually, and it takes a month to make just one. Then we improved on the three-axis CNC machining and could make one in one week. Later, we developed on the five-axis high-speed machining and is one component made every day. Now, we've further upgraded to automatic standardized production and would make one and even better one in three hours. Liu says in the machine turning and milling, there is the secret how China's space industry developed by pulling many brains together for one goal. We had state support in the project. We worked with domestic manufacturers from research to development and had our homegrown five-axis linkage CNC system, which could not be imported. And without this core technology, much modern space equipment is impossible. China's space industry has gone from weak to robust, and that comes from generations of people working together. For his generation, Liu says they are also eyeing a common goal, to make China a manufacturing power and a space power. And for that, they are already planning ahead. In future space equipment needs ever more advanced space manufacturing. I hope to employ new technologies in the area, for example, machine learning, digital simulation and other new technologies, and improve not only the efficiency, but also the quality and reliability of our work. And to bring China's space development to even greater speed. So, yeah, CGTN, Beijing. And that is the world today. Thank you for watching. I'm Asiyan Amdar in Washington. More headlines coming your way at the top of the hour.